Hi everybody, uh, this is the uh, Uniform Circular Motion Practice problem set uh, for the quiz that we're going to have, or the test, uh, however you want to describe it, on Friday. Um, hopefully you got this during your block, and if you didn't, it's uh, up on Plus Portals, um, and I guess let's just get into it. So uh, if you can do this, you should be able to do everything that we're going to ask you to do uh, on Friday. So let's uh, let's start this off. A record player number one turns uh, a record at 33 RPM. That's revolutions per minute, and we want the period. So RPM is in the uh, units of cycles per minute, but um, that's really not period because period is uh, time per cycle. So we need to get that into a unit of time in seconds per cycle and that should be uh, 60 seconds over 33 revolutions or cycles and that should give you 60 over 33 which is 1.81 seconds per cycle. Uh, next up the drummer beats a, a drummer a drummer beats a drum with a frequency of 4 Hertz that is 4 cycles per second and we need to get that again into some sort of seconds per cycle and uh, we will invert this so the seconds one you know four cycles per one second becomes one second per four cycles which would become uh, 0.25 seconds per cycle so uh, I hope you just remember the the basic equation that period is one over the frequency and frequency is 1 over the period. And as long as you're dealing with seconds, uh, these two should be pretty interchangeable as long as you just invert them. And uh, frequency, if you remember, the unit is always in the unit of the hertz, and uh, the period is always in units of seconds. So I hope that makes sense. I hope you've gone over that, and I hope that was a good refresher for you. Let's move on to number two, or actually number three at this point. Um, during their physics field trip to the amusement park, I wish Tyler and Maria took a ride around the Whirly Gig. The Whirly Gig ride consists of long swings which spin in a circle at relatively high speeds. As part of their lab, Tyler and Maria estimate that the riders travel through the circle with a radius of about six and a half meters and make one turn every 5.8 seconds. And we're going to calculate the velocity that, that they're going. And to do this, we need to remember the equation uh, for circular velocity uh, is 2 pi r over the period. And we actually give you the period in seconds, and we give you the radius in meters. And we will always want meters and seconds in our velocities. So if we just go ahead and plug and chug 2 pi r, which is 6.5, all over the period which is 5.8 seconds meters that should give us uh, a velocity of 7.03 meters per second I hope that made sense it's just plug and chug uh, let's go on to number four the tallest Ferris wheel in the world is located in Singapore standing 42 stories high and holding as many 780 passengers the Ferris wheel has a diameter of 150 meters uh, and takes approximately 30 minutes to make a full circle. So we've got two issues here as we're going to determine the speed of the riders in meters per second and miles per hour. First off, we want meters and we're given meters, but we want seconds and we are given minutes. So we have to get that minute into seconds. So 30 minutes times 60 seconds per minute, 30 times 60 is 1800 seconds in a half hour and more so we are calculating velocity VC is 2 pi r over the period now we give you a diameter and we need the radius so we have to cut that 150 in half to make 75 so to actually calculate what we're what we're doing here it's going to be 2 pi times the radius which is 75 meters all over the period which we just said was 1800 seconds and on a good day 2 pi times 75 over 1800 that should give you a very small number 0.26 meters per second 
And if we calculate 0.26 meters per second into miles per hour, we're going to remember 0.26 meters per second times 1 meter per second. Actually, it's not times 1 meter per second, it's times. Give me back my pen. Thank you. Times 2.24 miles per hour, uh, you should end up with 0.586 miles per hour. Um, because the conversion is just 1 to 2.24, so uh, over 1 meter per second, the meters per second cancel, so you'll be left with units in miles per hour. I hope that made sense. I don't see us making you do too many um, conversions like that. But uh, in case you want to know, that's how you do it. Uh, the next question is going to be number five. During the spin cycle of the washing machine, the clothes stick up to the outer wall uh, of the barrel as it spins at a high rate as high as 1800 revolutions per minute. The radius of the barrel is 26 centimeters. And we sort of said before, we need our, um, our velocities you know, especially if we're looking for the velocity, we need meters and seconds, and we've got centimeters and revolutions per minute, so we have to do a little bit of math before we even get into the questions. Uh, first off, we are dealing with 1800 revolutions per minute, but it's not really per minute, it's per 60 seconds, so we're going to we're going to get a frequency in Hertz of 1800 over 60, um, which, uh, of course, I didn't quite do that yet. Hold on, I'm gonna pause this. Sorry for wasting your time for a second. Pause. So I had to get my calculator, sorry. Uh, so it's gonna be 1800 divided by 60 seconds. So that is going to give us a frequency, because again, we're in revolutions in seconds, of 30 hertz 30 hertz but we don't need that we need to turn 30 hertz into a period so we have to take the inverse of 30 1 over 30 and that should be um, 0 0.03 but I want to verify that yeah 0 0.03333 so I'm just going to round it down to 0 0.03 so that 1 over 30 is going to be a period of 0 0.03 seconds and we have to remember that also the radius is 26 centimeters but we need that as meters which means 0.26 meters so these are the units and numbers that we're going to be working with to figure out a b and c so first the velocity vc is 2 pi r over t which is going to be 2 pi times 0.26 all over the period which is 0 0.03 and if we plug and chug that through uh, we should end up with 0.54 meters per second and then the second piece is the acceleration and if we remember the equation for the acceleration that's v squared over r which is going to turn into 0.54 squared over the radius which is 0.26 and that is going to be um, uh, need to do that again. Pause. Sorry, I couldn't read my own handwriting. This isn't 0.54 meters per second. You must think I'm crazy. 54 meters per second. So when we do this next equation, we're going to use 54 uh, squared for the velocity over 0.26 meters. And that's going to give us an incredible acceleration of uh, 11,000. Please work. You ever have one of those days? 11,215 meters per second squared. So if you remember, it's not really it's speeding up or slowing down. That's how quickly it's actually changing its direction. So 11,215 meters per second squared. Uh, and then finally, 
the acceler uh, the last thing is determine the FC on a pair of two kilogram wet jeans um, I don't know really how massive wet jeans can be but I figured two kilograms would be a nice place to start the equation for FC is there's actually two of them one of them is MA C which is M B squared over R either way you do this you should get the same uh, basically multiply this by the mass of two kilograms and you should get a uh, 2002 or 22,430 newtons and that my friends is why the drums of your washing machines are made of steel and not like paper because your jeans would go flying so I hope these three made sense despite the fact that I can't read my own handwriting um, and we can move on to number six uh, Elmira, New York boasts uh, of having the, the fastest carousel in the world. The merry-go-round at Outwood Park takes rides, riders on a spin at 18 miles an hour or 8 meters per second. The radius of the circle about which the uh, outside riders move is approximately 7.4 meters. So we have an R of 7.4 meters and a velocity of 8 meters per second. Determine the time for an outside rider to make a complete circle and then determine the acceleration of the riders. So let's do A first. We want to figure out the time to make one circle. If you remember correctly, that's the period. And we have an equation that can help us. Vc equals 2 pi r over t. And this time, instead of solving for Vc, we're going to solve for t. So we have the V, which is 8 meters per second, equals 2 pi times 7.4 all over t. We're going to multiply both sides by t to get rid of it go away and we're going to divide both sides by 8 to get rid of that so we're going to end up with t equals 2 pi times 7.4 all over 8 I hope that made sense and if you plug that into your calculator you should end up with 5.8 seconds and then if we want to know the acceleration that's v squared over r which they give us v and r so this is a really easy calculation so 8 squared over 7.4 which is going to turn into 64 over 7.4 and you should end up with 8.64 meters per second squared I hope that made sense so there are your two answers for that and we can move on to number seven we're a manufacturer of a CD-ROM uh, claims that the player can spin a disc as fast as 18, I'm sorry, 1200 revolutions per minute. Um, spinning at this rate, what's the speed of an outer row of data, and then what's the acceleration? So we're basically doing what we did on number six, except we're going to be solving for different variables. And more importantly, we have our little friend a frequency again, instead of a period. And we also, again, have a radius in centimeters instead of meters. So let's let's handle these one at a time. 1200 revolutions per minute, which is really 1200 revolutions per 60 seconds. We're going to invert that to make 60 seconds per 1200 revolutions. And that's going to turn into a period of are you ready for this? 0 0.05 seconds. So on your computers at home, you can think, throw a CD into the CD-ROM and it will go around once every five hundredths of a second. And um, how big is the circle they're making? Well, it's going to have a diameter, uh, I'm sorry, a radius of 0 0.056 meters. So that's my T. And that's my R. And now we can actually get into this problem because we're dealing with the right units. So we want to know what the speed is. Same equation it's always been. Vc is 2 pi r over t, which is going to turn into 2 pi times the radius of 0 0.056 meters per time, which is going to be 0 0.05 seconds, which we should get an answer of approximately 2 pi, because these two basically cancel each other out, or about 7 little over seven meters per second. I hope that made sense. Uh, now what's the acceleration of an outer row? Well, AC is um, 
L on the equation. It's going to be V squared over R, which is 7 squared over 0 0.056. So 49 over 0 0.056. Uh, that is accelerating pretty fast, not as fast as Jean's is, but 875 meters per second squared. hope that made sense. Here's the beginning, the first answer, and there's the second answer. And I hope you guys are doing well so far. Uh, number... Eight. In the display window of a toy store or local mall, a battery-powered battery powered plane is suspended from a string and flying in a horizontal circle. The 631 gram plane makes a complete circle every 2.15 seconds. The radius of the circle is 0.95 meters. So we have a bunch of different things. We have a mass that needs to be in kilograms, but it's grams, so that's 0.631 kilograms. We have a period of 2.15 seconds, so that's good and we have a radius of 0.95 meters so that's good the only thing we had to change was the 631 grams to 0 0.631 kilograms we want to know the force acting on the plane boom FC equals MV squared over R which turns into 0 0.631 times oh we don't have a V do we over the radius which is 0.95 so we have to figure out what we're going to put there Lucky for us, VC is 2 pi R over T, which is 2 pi times the radius of 0.95 over the period, which is 2.15. Ah. Do, do, do. 2.15, and we should be able to get a velocity of... Um, ba, 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 ba. Oh, velocity, acceleration, and centripetal force. Sorry, we got to do all three things, so we needed this anyway. Uh, so the velocity should be 2.77 meters per second. So that's the first bit. This is the third bit. The second bit is going to be AC is V squared over R, which is 2.77 squared over the radius of 0.95 and if we do that correctly that should be uh, da, 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 8 meters per second squared and then we can go back here and we now know the velocity and that velocity is 2.77 squared uh, so for FC, the third part, the centripetal force, FC is M.631, V squared, 2.77 squared over 0.95. That should give you, because I took up all this space because I didn't read, uh, 5.09 newtons. So I hope that made sense despite the fact that I did it out of order. I really did do it already. Just can't read my handwriting. It's the pain of getting old, but you don't care about that. Let's go to number nine. Uh, Dominic is the star discus thrower on South's varsity track and field team. In last year's regional competition, he whirled a 1.6 kilogram discus in a circle with a radius of 1.1 meters, ultimately reaching a speed of 52 meters per second before the launch. Determine the net force acting upon the discus in the moments before the launch. So we've got a couple things already going on here that we, we should like because it's going to make our lives a little bit easier. We know a velocity is 52 meters per second. We know a mass is 1.6 kilograms. And we know the radius is 1.1 meters. All three of these are in the correct units. So we just need to know F net, which is mv squared over r. And honestly, I thought when I was doing on paper, I thought that the plain one was the one where they just wanted us to figure out the net force. So, anyway, sorry. Uh, so we can just plug in, plug in chug. 1.6 times V, which is 52 squared over the radius, which is 1.1. And I'll get rid of that so it is not confusing. Or, yeah, don't be an eraser. Let's just keep writing. That's good. Yeah. 
Boom. If you plug all that in, you should get 3,933 newtons of force for that um, discus to, to move. All right, I hope that made sense. That was just plug and chug. Uh, as I said to your classes, the first bunch are pretty easy. The second few get a little tougher. So um, these get a little, little, little harder when we get to number 11. Uh, but 10 is still a pretty, pretty simple plug and chug. Uh, Landon and Jocelyn are parents, our partners in figure skating. Last weekend they perfected the death spiral element for inclusion in their upcoming competition. During this maneuver, Landon holds Jocelyn by the hand and swings her in a circle while she maintains blades on the ice, stretched out in a near horizontal orientation. I think you should be able to see it on Paris figure skating uh, in the Olympics. Anyway, determine the net force which must be applied to Jocelyn with a mass of 51 kilograms. Uh, if she rotates in a circle of radius 61 centimeters once every 1.9 seconds. So most of this is good in terms of our units. The kilograms are good. The period of 1.9 seconds is good. Unfortunately 61 centimeters is not good. We have to change that to 0.61 meters for our radius. Uh, and we want to know the force. So that's going to be FC equals MV squared over R which is 51 times V. Oh, again, they didn't give us the velocity. V equals 2 pi R over T equals 2 pi times 0.61 over the period 1.9. That should give you 2 meters per second. That goes here, 2 squared over the radius which is 0.61. So you see how you need the velocity here to be able to go in there and figure out your uh, centripetal force. Uh, and that should be 334 newtons if you plug all that in correctly. I hope that made sense. Um, and you know it's okay as you guys go through you, you, you should be realizing oh you know this should be a plug and chug mv squared over r well, I got the mass but I don't have the velocity, so we have to go over here, figure out the velocity, and then plug it back in. All right. Now, for the fun ones, in an effort to rev up my class, I do a demonstration with a bucket of water. I would never do it with a bucket of water. It ended badly once my third year teaching physics. Tied to a 1.3 meter long string, the bucket and water have a mass of 1.8 kilograms. I whirl the bucket in a vertical circle such that it has a speed of 3.9 meters per second at the top and 6.4 meters per second at the bottom. And as long as the rope doesn't break, we're all good. Unfortunately, it broke. Long story. Anyway, uh, determine the acceleration of the bucket at each location. That's part one. And then part two is to determine the net force experienced by the bucket at each location. And then three, draw a free body diagram for the bucket at each location and determine the tension force in the string on the two locations. So this is a whole bunch of situation going on here that we have to really think about. Um, I'm actually going to break this up in half. Um, and I, I almost feel like we should, I should start this by doing the free body diagram and then we can figure out the tension. So here's, and this is going to be a, a free body diagram with other stuff in it. So here's the circle. I need it to be a bigger circle. Here's the circle that the, you know what? I'm going to make a real circle. A real circle. There you go. And we'll move it a little over here. And now, so we're dealing with something at the top and at the bottom. So I hope you realize that we're dealing with a couple of forces here. One of them is tension and one of them is gravity. There's no normal force. So the only two things working on this, um, this bucket are tension and gravity. And together, they hold that bucket going in the circle. So that, those two forces are always going to add up to forces that keep the bucket going in the circle. Which is to say, the F net on something going in a circle is FC. I hope that makes sense. So in order for something to be going in that circle, all the forces have to add up to mv squared over r. And that's why we can make this, equa uh, this equality happen. So what's happening at the top? Well, you've got two forces, gravity going down and tension 
going down. Okay? And in this case, Ft plus Fg equal Fc. And we have to remember that at the top, tension is directed down and gravity is directed down. So these are both going to be pretty small forces. Okay? And we're going to end up with, you know, we're going to do some math in a few seconds and you'll see that the tension has to be relatively small because gravity is really doing most of the work keeping the bucket in that circle. But once we get down to the bottom, now we've got gravity working down, and I guess I shouldn't have made it a huge arrow, but gravity is working down, and therefore, because the bucket still has to go in this upward motion, you know, whichever way we're circling it, we're going to have a big tension force going up. Okay, and we're going to come back to this, but I think it's really important for us to see what's, what's happening here. So, the acceleration of the bucket at each location. Fine, we got the top. I'm going to deal with the top up here. And I think I'll explain it as we go. The top can be up here, the bottom can be over here. So, for letter A, V, C, uh, I don't want the velocity, I want acceleration. Acceleration is V squared over R at the bottom, A equals V squared over R. At the top, our velocity is 3.9 squared over R, which is 1.3. And at the bottom, we're dealing with a bigger speed, 6.4 squared over R, which again is 1.3, and for both of those uh, we will have 11.7 newtons and 31.5 newtons. I'm sorry, 30 meters per second squared. Meters per second squared. Okay, so that's A. Then we have to determine the two net forces. And I think that this is where things get a little bit interesting. Um, the net force is also FC. Okay, so FC equals MV squared over R. FC equals MV squared over R, which is the net force. Because all the forces are going to add together to make this thing go in a circle. And if we plug in our mv squared over r, we should, you know, this is going to be, what, uh, 1.8, 1 1.8 times the v, which is 3.9 squared over the radius, which is 1.9, 3. Uh, what is it? 1.3. Sorry, 1.3. And this one is going to be 1.8 times V squared, 6.4 squared over the radius, 1.3. And we should end up with 21.06 newtons for this side. And for going, coming, so at the bottom, it's going to be 56. 0.7 newtons. Now I want you to think very critically about this. F net equals ma. F net equals fc. F net describes what the object is doing. So when it's up here, which way is all of those newtons going? And which way is the object going to be accelerating? And I hope you're saying, well at the top we're dealing, you know, centripetal force is always pulling inside, which means the object is always accelerating in. Well, when you're at the top, the net force is going to be negative. And at the bottom, the net force is always pulling in, so the net force has to be going up, which means the net force down at the bottom is positive. So I hope that makes sense, and that's it's a weird sort of thing to wrap around. Um, I don't know if your teachers have spoken about it. I know I was actually going to talk about it to my physics class tomorrow because this is sort of the culmination of all the cool stuff that um, all the uh, 
all the, 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 the centripetal force and circular motion deals with. So again, at the top, the net force is going down, and at the bottom, the net force is going up. And this explains a couple of things. First off, usually when you're whipping a bucket around, not like I've ever done this before, but usually the rope snaps at the bottom. Why does it snap at the bottom? Because in order for this thing to be able to continue upwards, you have to give a lot more tension than what the weight is. You remember, gravity's pulling it down, but the tension has to beat it to bring the bucket back up. So down here is where you have the most tension on that string. And if your string isn't strong, the tension needs to be too big for it, and it can snap and toss the bucket on a student. Oops. Anyway, up here, tension and gravity are going in the same direction, and the net force is down. So in order for the bucket to keep going in the circle, gravity is already pulling it down, so the tension doesn't have to be all that big. And we're going to prove that because we're going to draw, we did draw free body diagrams, and we're going to calculate the tension force at the two locations. And the way we do that is we start out with, by, with saying, all right, here's the net force. But the net force is also equal to the tension force and the gravitational force, Fg. And here is the same thing. We have F net, which is positive 56.7. That equals the tension force and the gravitational force. So far, so good. So let's plug some numbers in. I know the mass of my, my bucket is 1.8 kilograms. And if I multiply 1.8 times 9.8, I should end up with negative 17.64 newtons equals negative 21.06 newtons. Okay plus my tension. So what do I do here to calculate my tension? Well, that's easy. I add 17.64 to both sides. And if I do that, I should get negative 3.96 newtons. And that equals my tension. And if you think about it, well, this thing is going around in circles. In order to make it go around in circles, I need 21.06 newtons of net force in order to make this thing go around in circles as given to me by mv squared over r. Well, gravity is already, you know, I need 21. 17 and a half of it is already happening because of gravity. So the tension doesn't need to be all that big, 3.96 newtons, in order to make it continue going in that circle. Okay? And if you weren't sure, the, the reason that this is a negative and not a positive, which will come over here, the reason this is a negative is because the net force is going down. Okay, It's always pointed towards the middle. Fair? Over here, we have a different animal. The tension is what we're solving for again, and the gravity, the bucket hasn't gotten heavier or lighter, so the, the, the bucket is still negative 17.64 newtons plus Ft. But now we have a positive 56.7 newtons. Well, if I'm going to solve for Ft, I have to add 17.64 to both sides. And doing that gives me a tension force of 74.34 newtons. And what does that mean? Well, all right, let's think about this. I have a bucket going in a circle. And at the bottom, gravity is pulling that bucket down. So gravity is working against whatever tension I've got with 17.64 newtons. So we know the tension has to be at least 17.64 newtons because that'll just keep it still. But I want this bucket to accelerate up. And I want it to accelerate in a circular fashion. So in order to get it to go in a circular fashion, I need 56.7 newtons to make this thing go in that circle. Well. If I need 56 newtons going up to make it go in a circle, and I need an additional 17.64 newtons up to get rid of the grav not get rid of the gravity, but to offset the gravity, well, I need that tension to be 74.34 newtons. Okay? And if the tension, the maximum, you know, we're talking about the fishing line, and it's got a maximum tensile strength. If the, ten if the maximum tensile strength of your string is 70 newtons, you whip it around, and it will snap on the bottom and go careening tangent into some 
possibly poor human beings face. Sad face. So that's sort of the idea. And remember that the bucket would go tangent if we ever snapped it. All right, I hope that makes sense. Um, it's something that, again, I don't know if Mr. Tachi's class really got this whole lesson. Um, I know, again, it was something I was planning on doing on Thursday. But it's a really elegant sort of um, explanation to, to talk about what's happening with circular motion. All right, I hope that made sense. Uh, 76 kilogram pilot perform on an air show, and we're going to sort this. We're going to see this sort of rehash itself a couple more times. 76 kilogram pilot on an air show performs a loop to loop with his plane. At the bottom of a 52 meter meter radius loop, the plane's moving 48 meters per second. To determine the normal force acting on the pilot. Well, that's easy um, because there's only one force keeping this pilot going in circles, and that is the normal force. So the FC is the normal force and that equals mv squared over r and they give us a mass 76 they give us a v 48 squared and they give us a radius in the right units all of these are in the right units 52 this times this squared divided by that should give us 4112 newtons cool um, that was plug and chug Next, Alexis in her Toyota Camry. Alexis is in her Toyota Camry trying to make a turn off the expressway at 19 meters per second. Uh, turning radius of, of the level curve is 35 meters. Her car has a mass of 1240 kilograms. Term the acceleration, net force, and minimum value of the coefficient of friction which is required to keep her car on the road. The first two are pretty simple. The third one might be a little tricky. So let's, let's do the first two and then we'll attack the third little piece in a second, okay? The acceleration. AC is V squared over R. They give us the V, 19 squared, and the radius, which is 35 meters. And that should be a, uh, that should give us an acceleration of 10.3 meters per second squared. Then they want the net force. Well, F net is the frictional, uh, I'm sorry, FC which is mv squared over r, which is 1240 times v squared, 19 squared, all over r, which is again 35 meters. And we should end up with a force of 12,789 newtons. Now for this other thing. You need to ask yourself, what is the force that's making her car go around that curve? And I hope you answer friction, okay? Which is to say, F net, which is FC, equals FF. Now we're going to dust off some knowledge. MV squared over R equals mu times the normal force, right? Friction is the normal force. Anything going in a circle has to obey mv squared over r. But if you remember, normal force is really mv squared over r. Normal force is really m times g. Normal force, gravity down, normal force up. On a flat surface, they offset. So you can calculate how big this is if you know the mass, but I'm not even going to bother with that because I have mass on both sides. Kill the mass. Not really kill the mass, but get rid of the mass. And yeah, I just wrote that back in so I could cross it out. So what I really end up with, and this is the magic, they want the coefficient? Well, that's it. V squared over R equals mu times G. Geez, didn't we already do V squared over R? Don't we already know what that is? V squared over R, 10.3. 10.3 equals mu times G. But we know what G is, right? Isn't G just 9.8? Negative 9.8, but because it's normal force, it's going up, so we drop the negative. So if you calculate and solve for mu, Divide both sides by 
boom, boom, mu is going to be equals 1.05, which actually stands between 0 and 4. It's actually right about the right mu for a tire. So I hope that made sense. It's really elegant, just, um, you know, the beginning of it's very plug and chug, but realizing that the centripetal force is caused by friction allows you to figure out what mu is, okay? So continuing, 2002, a skateboarder Bob Brunquist became the first person to successfully navigate a 360 full degree full pipe turn, uh, determine the minimum speed with which would be required at the top of the loop of a uh, 1.8 meter radius pipe. Well, we're going off of the same idea again being FC, we're making a circle, has to equal the net force. And if we're going around in a circle, we want to know what the minimum speed is for an object here to make it over, but if we're talking minimum speed, we're basically saying, um, well, if you're on the half pipe, let's, say, let's start with that. If you're on the half pipe, you're saying FC is going to be what you get when you add together gravity and the normal force. Okay? Um, and the normal force is going the wrong way. Uh, gravity and the normal force, right? So FG plus FN, and they're both going down, right? And FC would also be going down. But the minimum speed would be the part where you just barely make it over and you don't fall straight down. So we're basically approaching the point where normal force is essentially zero. So when we ask you for the minimum, you're talking about, well, what if there is no normal force? Well, in that case, the centripetal force has to be gravity, and that's it. And you no longer get to play with that normal force anymore. It's just gravity that's barely keeping you in that circle, and you're barely going fast enough and as you come down further and further, you're going to pick up normal force again. All right. So at what point do we need FC to equal FG? Well, MV squared is over R is what FC is, and FG is M times G. Again, M's cancel. V squared over R equals gravity. And I'm going to do this. We want to know the speed, right? So V squared is what we're looking for. Gosh, I wish they gave us an R. Oh, they did. 1.8 equals G. I hope you know G is 9.8. Technically negative, but I just care about the, the velocity. I'm not going to talk about negative velocity. Um, so we're going to multiply both sides by 1.8. Cancel. 9.8 times 1.8. It's going to be v squared, and that is going to be 17.64, but we don't want v squared, we want v, so we're going to square root it, so v is going to be 4.2 meters per second. So any faster than 4.2, this guy gets to the top and he just falls down on his head, and that's probably not a very good thing. Any faster than 4.2 now he's got a little bit of normal force helping him pull him or push him back into the center of that and you know you can't we, we sort of established you can't have the normal force if we're doing just barely getting over so the minimum speed he needs to be going is 4.2 meters per second okay and last but certainly not least we go back to another frictiony problem so we're driving a 1500 kilogram Camaro through a horizontal curve at a some speed We've got a radius, we want to know, again, what mu could be. Well, we, we went through this already, and we can sort of take the shortcut. The centripetal force is caused by frictional force. And if we get our mv squared over r for our frictional force, or I'm sorry, for our centripetal force, and our mu times fn, but that's just mg for our frictional force, we know the mass is canceled, so you don't even need to care about the fact that it's 1,500 kilograms. V squared over R equals mu times G. And I hope they give us some of this information, don't, don't you? Well, we know the speed is 23 meters per second. So there's 23 squared, V squared over R, 65, equals mu times G, which is 9.8. Again, 
Normal force would be pointed upwards, counteracting gravity, which points down, so we're going to take a positive 9.8. Um, multiply both sides by 65. Please stop becoming an eraser. That's annoying. 65. Multiply that by 65 on both sides. We get rid of that. You're left with 23 squared. Uh, 23 squared equals mu times 9.8 times 65. 65. Stop turning into an eraser. I hope you're doing this faster than I'm typing it or writing it. Um, I don't know what these two equal, but I know if you square 23 and divide it by whatever that is, you should get a mu of 0.83. Sound like a plan? I hope so. Um, so that was the homework. and. Seriously, especially if you can attack the last one, two, three, four, five or so, you should absolutely be fine for, for the, the assessment on Friday. All right, I hope this helped. I will see you guys in class.